Remember that big meeting in Washington about electric cars that didn't include Tesla? U.S. President Biden said that his goal was that 50% of cars sold in the year 2030 will be zero emission vehicles. That's less than nine years away. So question is, is that doable? Currently, less than 2% of the cars on American roads are electric. The U.S. sells about 17, 18, 19 million cars annually, and just a little bit over 300,000 of those are electric. So we're at around 2% right now. Of course, one of the big things you need for an EV is a battery, a big battery. About 40% of the cost of an EV is battery, and most battery production is based in China. So the question is, can the U.S. jumpstart local production? To chat about that, we're here with Penny Alphys, the CEO of USA Rare Earth. Welcome. Thank you, John. How are you? Hey, doing well. Thank you for coming. What's the biggest blocker to achieving this monstrous 50% goal? Yeah, well, I think it's not only the batteries, as you mentioned, it's the rare earths that are required for the EV drivetrain. So we have two, if you will, groups of critical minerals, uh, none of which are being produced, uh, you know, in any sort of quantities today outside of China that would um, assist the supply chain here and get us to that goal. So while I, I think the uh, announcement by President Biden and the executive orders are extremely important, and it's always important to have goals. We have a lot of roadblocks ahead of us in order to achieve that 50% electrification by 2030, primarily starting with obviously the supply chain issues, having domestic battery manufacturing, having domestic mining and processing of rare earths that can then be turned into permanent magnets that go into the electric vehicles. What are those rare earths specifically and uh, where are they used primarily? So there are four rare earths that are in the permanent magnets. Um, you've got two light rare earths, neodymium and praseodymium, and you've got two heavies, which is disposium and terbium. And they are used in the EV drivetrains and they're high pressure temperature magnets that stop the car from overheating. They allow uh, the vehicle to do what it needs to do as far as sort of the, uh, the key electrification. In fact, we find um, these magnets in, for example, sulfur. So uh, to stop your sulfur from overheating, uh, there are magnets in there. They're found in most advanced uh, weaponry defense uh, equipment. F-35 striker jet has about a ton of rare earth magnets in them. Wind turbines have a significant amount. So we actually, it's not just EVs. We have a, a national security issue in this country, which is being recognized by yesterday's bill, a bipartisan bill by uh, Eric Swalwell and uh, Guy Rushenthaler. Um, and it has been recognized by Congress as well. I mean, we can't build defense applications and uh, obviously electric vehicles and other things without these materials. This episode of Tech First is sponsored by my creator coin, Dollar Smart. Don't think of it like Bitcoin, think of it like a backstage pass at a concert. Get some at rally.io slash creator slash SMRT to pitch me on podcast guests, earn weekly rewards, get social amplification, and get or give feedback on strategy and plans. That is super interesting. I want to dig into that a little bit and what that bill is about. But uh, I believe China is the source of most of the world's rare earths. And I believe that recently, I think it was about half a year ago, they, they said something about it's a strategic resource and they created some directives about how they could be exported, if they could be exported, other things like that. This U.S. government resolution that you mentioned, what does it mean? What does it say? Yeah, I mean, there's four parts of the supply chain. So you've got the actual raw materials that come out of a mine. You've got the processing. You've got the metal making and the magnet manufacturing. So this is an extremely ambitious and uh, very intricate process to go all the way from mine through to magnet. And the bill yesterday, it touches on one part of this, which is, the, and a very important part, which is the magnet manufacturing. Uh, there are other acts like the Rare Act that's also bipartisan uh, that touches on the other parts of the supply chain, including the mining, the processing, the metal making. And that's there, first of all, to alleviate the concerns around China potentially manipulating the pricing by further subsidizing their own domestic rare earth uh, sector. But it's there to also incentivize the United States and, uh, you know, I guess investors here and, and companies involved in the sector 
to actually proceed with developing mines, processing facilities and, and magnets. Uh, so it's all very important. It affects the bottom line and it uh, does take away some of the potential sting from China. That being said, uh, you know, China, if you want to talk about sort of protectionism, et cetera, I mean, the United States has its own regulations through CFIUS. China has its regulations and we're in a very different situation now than we were back in 2010 when China cut off rare earth exports from Japan for 40 days and the US, Japan and others went to protest WTO and China was forced to reverse that decision and resume exports. And the reason we're in a different situation now than we were then is at that time there was an abundance of these materials, there was a surplus of these materials and it was just a nefarious action on the part of China. Since 2018, China have become a net importer of rare earths and as part of their Made in China 2025 mandate as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, the aspirations to have 25 million electric vehicles on the roads, they today are well within their rights to have those materials for domestic consumption, domestic production of materials or, or product to be shipped around the world. So we're in a situation right now where it's less around the potential weaponization of rare earths and it's more a supply and demand issue. And if we look at the numbers of, you know, what we require as far as a supply chain in this country and even countries like Japan, Korea, Germany, where uh, automotives are manufactured, where you have consumer electronics manufactured, we have a huge disparity in current uh, demand and supply, and it's going to grow even further as we move toward 2030. And, um, you know, rare earth deposits, lithium deposits, but especially rare earth deposits, they don't just get turned on by the flick of a switch. They involve, you know, sometimes a decade or two of drilling, uh, having the right economics, being able to develop those projects. Um, so a lot needs to get done for us to have any sort of independence from China uh, if we're going to get to the goals that we're trying to achieve. Big picture, how much do we need? Um, uh, how much do we use right now? How much do we produce locally? And if we're going to get to this 50% figure, what kind of domestic production of rare earths does the U.S. need? So if you look at some of the uh, experts and analysts in the space, um, they're looking at, we need 10 times more between now and 2030. We probably need about 20 to 25 times more than we have now between now and, and 2050. And I think that's understated. The reason I think that's understated is because what's being factored into those figures are the projects that are coming online or the projects that are online already. But what's being neglected in, in some of this information is that some of these projects already have offtake agreements with China, already have offtake agreements with German companies, already have offtake agreements with the governments of Japan. So if you look at what's coming online, what's online already, we may need, you know, 20 times uh, what currently is available today uh, by 2030. Uh, but certainly even using that figure of 10 times, you know, we don't have any magnet rare earths being produced in the country today. Uh, and we don't have any uh, rare earths actually being produced and processed in the United States today. So we need to get a number of projects online. We'll also have to collaborate with countries like Australia and Canada, where they do have some rare earth production starting. In the case of Australia, you've obviously got Linus and, and a couple of other companies there. But you've got, you know, for example, Linus has an offtake with the Japanese government through JogMeg. So do those materials come to the United States? They come to the supply chain? A, a lot of questions. Uh, and then that's the mines. We don't have processing in this country right now. So our company, USA Rare Earth, has developed a processing uh, method, not just for our project in Texas, but also to be able to treat third-party materials. So our ambitions are to actually bring more of these uh, materials from Canadian projects, from Australian projects, from elsewhere in the world into our supply chain and assist with the processing as an alternative to those materials going to China today for processing. So if we need 10x more materials, rare earth materials by 2030, uh, give me a sense, what kind of tonnage are we talking about there? Are we talking 100,000 tons of this material? Are we talking a million? What's it look like roughly? So if we look at the end product, magnets, for example. So we acquired last year, the only permanent rare earth or sintered neo magnet plant in the United States or in the Americas for that matter. That was the magnet plant formerly owned and operated by Hitachi, North Carolina. So that magnet plant is capable of producing 2,400 ton of permanent magnets a year. In 2019, that accounted for 17% of overall neo magnet imports into the U S that would account for 
a lot less uh, today and certainly as we move into the future. So whether it's whether the requirements for EVs is 8,000, 10,000, 15,000 ton of magnets, we obviously have requirements for the national defense stockpile. We have requirements for defense contractors, consumer electronics companies, renewables. We are well short because other than this one plant, which can produce 2,400 ton a year, there's no other magnet manufacturing capabilities in the United States today. So um, there's a difference of opinion as to what that tonnage is, but it's certainly many multiples of this one magnet plant. Wow. Which means that uh, if you've got this plant up and running, you need multiple others uh, and you need your mine up and running. I'm guessing that's a multi-year process as well. And there's probably tons of environmental uh, regulations to, to go through as well to get that kicked off. Uh, when do you anticipate being able to start production? Yeah. So John, you've touched on a very important point here. So the round top deposit, which is located in Texas is scheduled to come online in 2023. So what we're doing now is we've commissioned our pilot plant, which has been completed. Uh, we've already started laying the groundwork for a demonstration plant on side, which should be up sort of end of this year, beginning of next year, which will provide materials to customers, uh, sample materials to customers and then full production in 2023. We're fortunate that we're on state of Texas land, so we are, have a different environmental uh, regime, if you will, to those sort of on federal land. And we're already seeing with uh, lithium companies like Lithium Americas, uh, Piedmont, um, two companies that we actually need to go into lithium production, we already see they're experiencing issues with environmental groups, NGOs, et cetera. So I think there's going to be a balancing act for this administration um, looking at where are the materials coming from today that are going into EVs, renewables. And if you look at that situation, it's, it's completely unacceptable. We have materials coming from mines and processing facilities in China that by their own ambition, as has been reported on 60 Minutes, BBC and elsewhere, I mean, they're causing significant environmental devastation to the surrounding areas. People in the population nearby have got sick from uh, the processing and mining of these materials. Yet we're taking them and putting them into, into our EVs. I mean, that's not sustainable. Uh, the US based EV companies are aware of this. The Germans, the Japanese, the Koreans all aware of this and that this has to change. And there is the sustainability aspect, not just the supply chain issues. So any mine that's going to get permitted to come into production in this country is certainly going to have to go through environmental rigors, some more than others, but no mine in the United States can get permitted into production without having or adhering to the highest in environmental standards. Um, certainly a lot better than anything coming out of China. So there's going to have to be a balancing act by the administration to say, you know, what's reasonable. We want to have electrification. We want to have a green economy. We want to have renewables. Well, where are we getting these materials from? And there has been talk about a reliance on Canada and Australia. And this is a, a very foolhardy way to approach this for a couple of reasons. One, Australian and Canadian project owners, they're not required to sell into the US supply chain. They don't have CPS regulations. They could sell to anyone. They can sell their materials to China. In fact, some Australian companies have offtake agreements with China in place already, which means those materials will not come into the US. The other thing is the US government doesn't have an apparatus similar to that of China or even Japan, where they're buying materials or entering into agreements on behalf of whether it's the automotive sector, consumer electronics companies. I mean, the US government is going to buy materials for what's needed for defense and, you know, for the national defense stockpile. But beyond that, I mean, they're not going to be buying materials for a GM or a Ford or anyone else. So it's not a well, sustainable. That's actually really interesting. So what you're saying is that China will buy materials for its entire industry, which means it can act as a single player for a large number of organizations and be a very big buyer that you've got to listen to. The U.S. just lets the companies go and get their source, their own supply, correct? Well, it's not only China will, China is doing that. And, and yeah. China is the way that the uh, system is set up there. It's uh, they buy and then they decide where these materials will go to. Of course, you have individual companies that are entering into offtakes, but you know, a lot of them are state controlled or there's a lot of state uh, influence on those, on those companies. But I mean, even Japan, I mean, Japan does because of what happened in 2010, as I mentioned earlier, Japan has taken a very important and robust approach to this, which is working through METI and JOGMEG to fund companies like Linus, secure the offtake for their materials, and then they're bringing those materials, whether it's for defense, whether it's for consumer electronics, other sectors, but they are working on behalf of not just defense, but they're working on behalf of the overall economy that will require these materials. 
I mean, the Australian government as well, but this is sort of from the export side, the Australian government has put funding packages together. They handhold their rare earth and mining companies. They introduce them to investors, introduce them to offtake partners. Um, the U S government doesn't operate that way. And I don't see that changing any time in the near term. So the question is, is how can we spur the capital markets and private capital to be funding these projects and how can we make it easier, not harder for, for companies to get projects up and running and, and producing? Well, I'm guessing if there's, uh, if the price of those is going up, then the, the private markets are going to be very interesting. Now, the question is, is there enough supply in the ground in the U S in accessible places? Do you think there is? Not right now. So if you look at the round top deposit, which is our deposit in Texas, about 30% of the deposit are rare earths, primarily heavy rare earths and a uh, 30% is lithium. So we're quite a unique project and we have some of the key materials. We've got the largest gallium resource and half the zirconium, some materials required for 5G, for chipsets, semiconductors, et cetera. Yet if you look at the materials that we have for permanent magnets or for lithium, it still accounts for sort of a percentage of the overall you know, supply chain requirements in the United States. We would need another four or five round tops to go up to start looking at having sort of what we would call independence or, or a lack of complete reliance on China. I mean, we've got to get to 50%, 60% so that it's not weaponized, uh, so that we can be independent, similarly to what's happened sort of, you know, if you remember the old days of OPEC and the embargoes and the US now has become a net exporter of oil and natural gas. I mean, that's removed a, a huge security issue, if you will, from us and, and an economic one as well. And a similar attack needs to happen. The issue here is, is that we have a few projects that are still in what we call development phase, uh, uncertainty around whether or not they, they will get into production, whether they're economic. So we still have a decade at least before we have a clear picture on whether or not the U S has enough materials. We are going to have to rely on Canada to a great extent, which has some projects that have sort of in development phase as well. Um, but for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to have, uh, materials from the, from the United States, from Canada, from Australia and other friendly countries as well, in order to establish a secure supply chain. I'm guessing that as we move to a green economy, um, clearly there's a lot that needs to be done to make that happen, but it's not just EVs. I'm guessing it's also wind turbines. Uh, I'm guessing it's also generators and other areas of sustainable energy that require these magnets and rare earths. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, you look at a, a wind turbine, a wind turbine also has almost a ton of rare earth magnets in them to, to make them function. Wow. So, you know, in a again, have, in a, have 35, which do I want? <laughs> Well, ex exactly. The problem is that the materials today for both are coming from China, right? And in the case of the vents applications, you've got a national security issue. In the case of the wind turbines, you've got a, a big sort of sustainability hypocrisy, if you will, of taking materials that haven't been mined and processed in a friendly way, an environmentally friendly way at all, yet they're going to our green economy. And I think what we see, you know, for example, with uh, John Kerry imploring China to cut down emissions that what's done in one part of the world has an effect on another part of the world. So it's no good for us sitting in the United States saying, let China destroy their environment and send the materials here. I mean, that's just going to bring us all down. I mean, it's, it's, it's all or nothing kind of thing. So, yeah. but I mean, from the environmentalists, I mean, and I, I get where they come from certain mines in certain parts of the world have caused issues. We've seen the oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera. It's very different. And, and I mean, you've got organizations like Irma which Ford and BMW and Microsoft and others have signed up to, to adhere to some sort of ESG rating. What we've done as well at USA Rare Earth is we voluntarily signed up uh, to a partnership with a group in Australia called Saucer International. They use a DNA chemical fingerprint to actually trace the provenance of the materials all the way from mine to magnet so that we can provide an end user certification uh, to our customers and they in turn can provide it to their customers. So you see where the materials will be mined, where they were processed, where the metal making happened and where the magnet manufacturing happened. And this is not blockchain, this is DNA chemical fingerprints, so it can't be manipulated. And I think, you know, these kind of measures, um, are very important to enact at this stage. And one of them is doing is very important as well. Very, very interesting stuff. Challenging stuff because I don't think there's any such thing as a totally environmentally clean mind, but obviously there's better ways of doing it and worse ways of doing it. And it's also very important for us to get on renewable energy and to stop pumping hydrocarbons into our atmosphere. Penny, I want to thank you for your time um, and your insight. I thank you very much, John. Thanks for having me.